Dave Warner, Allison Marsh, watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. It is now 76 hours since the Attorney General's press conference. Not one of those witnesses and not one of their lawyers has a copy of the transcript, as we understand it, of their own client's interview. Nobody. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo showing no signs of backing down. His attorney speaking out as Cuomo now faces a criminal complaint from one of his accusers. We're now the first administration in history to add jobs every single month on our first six months in office. And the only one in history to add more than four million jobs during the first six months. President Biden feeling pretty good about the July jobs report. Who hired last month and what it says about our economic recovery. And Allison Felix making history in Tokyo, snagging her 10th Olympic medal to become the most decorated female track and field Olympian ever. Governor Andrew Cuomo's attorneys responding to the AG's report on sexual allegations against the governor. Cuomo's legal team raising questions about its fairness. There is a very serious legal issue about whether the attorney general's office is correct or not. And that serious legal issue should have gotten more consideration in a report that reaches a conclusion about illegality. NBC News investigations correspondent Tom Winter joining me now. Tom, Cuomo's attorney is talking legality. They're also taking issue with the fact that they didn't get an advanced copy of the AG's report. Uh, tell us more. Well, they're not required to. <laughs> it's as simple as that. According to New York state law, uh, <laughs> when there's an independent investigation, an, an independent report that is uh, to be filed, uh, it does not need to be given to anybody in advance. So let's remember, uh, Allison, that this investigation was actually prompted by the governor's senior counsel, Beth Garvey. They called for this. The governor welcomed this investigation. Uh, they underwent the in investigation. And the statute that gives them the ability to do that requires that a report is made weekly and is shared with not only the attorney general, but also the governor. So in this particular instance, the senior counsel said, wait a minute, the conduct that we're looking into here involves the governor. So we don't need a weekly report on that. That's not what we should be getting. But instead, at the end of this, put out a public report. There's nothing in the law and there's nothing in the letter that says that they want an advanced copy and a chance to rebut it in the meantime. Some of the examples brought up by the former U.S. attorney, Paul Fishman, now uh, working on behalf of the governor's mm -hmm. office, uh, just, uh, just don't apply to this particular situation, Allison. Tom, the governor's attorney is also responding to a criminal complaint from a former executive assistant. Uh, what are they saying? What's she alleging? Right. So the executive uh, assistant came forward after the governor, according to the AG's report, after the governor started making statements, particularly when he said uh, that he had never touched anyone inappropriately. Apparently, that very much upset this executive assistant. It was at that point that she uh, actually broke down uh, in the office or, or at least showed some sort of emotion, according to the AG's report, uh, talked to two other executive assistants about what happened, talked to the boyfriend of one of the other executive assistants, who happens to be an FBI employee about what happened. He counseled her to go to uh, an attorney and engage with that attorney about what happened to her. She's included here in this report. Now, uh, we have some response now on the record from one of the governor's attorneys. Let's take a listen. She was at the mansion that day for several hours. She wasn't just working with the governor. She was working with other staffers. Emails that she sent while she was at the mansion reflect that she was joking while she was there. She was eating snacks. And she even offered to stay longer at the mansion when her work was done. Here is the timeline that the investigators don't talk about. Allison, while we've been speaking here, uh, there is a tweet that has been sent out uh, specific to this issue by a reporter from the Albany Times Union. They interviewed this executive assistant, number one, and the reporter mm -hmm. points out that the woman who's involved here uh, says it is not November 16th when this incident occurred. It was around that time, but it was not that day. So even controversy here okay. about who's responding to what and to whom. Yeah. Obviously, this is going to continue to move forward here as this criminal investigation goes forward as well. 
So, Tom, I think people have a lot of questions about what all this means for the governor, right? Will he retain his job? Could he potentially face criminal charges? Could he face civil suits? What could this particular uh, criminal complaint mean for the governor? Well, this criminal complaint, for the first time, really brings in uh, the possibility of not only the governor being in some legal trouble, as you pointed out, civil or criminal, but actually it's a very specific incident, and it's an incident that could result in the governor potentially being in handcuffs. Now, he's not been charged with any crime, and he, again, as I said before, steadfastly denies that this incident even occurred. Uh, but having said that, this is a very specific, and as I mentioned, the attorney general's in investigators, one, a, uh, a noted sexual harassment attorney, somebody who's proficient and an expert in this field, highly regarded, Ann Clark, and then the former acting U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, June Kim, they found her quite credible. They raised questions about the governor's own responses to her claims uh, in the course of their investigation. So this appears to be quite serious. We talked about earlier in the week this possibility that there could be uh, criminal inquiries and that this was being looked at by four or five different district attorneys in New York. But this criminal complaint here is very detailed today and presents a real legal jeopardy for the governor if, in fact, through the course of that investigation, they determined that he broke the law, Allison. Mm -hmm. Tom, as we've been showing in a banner on the screen here, we know the Governor Cuomo has until August 13th, that's next Friday, to turn in uh, evidence uh, before this impeachment investigation uh, from New York lawmakers is wrapped up. Anything you're eyeing between now and then? I realize, obviously, we're getting press updates mm -hmm. and things like that at the last minute, but is there anything on the docket right now that we should be aware of before that wraps? Right. Uh, in, there's no specific date or marker going forward. I, I suspect that it's going to take uh, at least uh, several days, much more likely several weeks, uh, for this uh, criminal complaint to be looked at and investigated to the point where the district attorney can make decisions on charging. As far as civil complaints, those can be filed at any time, quite literally, in this day and age. People yep. can file lawsuits uh, whenever they can electronically do it. So there's no particular time frame there. Yes, the next step would be uh, that August 13th deadline uh, that's there on the screen. All right, Tom, I do have a feeling that we'll be talking to you quite a bit next week. In the meantime, <laughs> have a great weekend. You too. <laughs> Thanks, Allison. Our efforts are, like, futile. Like, it, it's like we, we aren't making any difference, even though we're trying. Uh, we're out here working the 100-degree heat to try to help these people, and we get resistance at every corner. Healthcare workers in Texas absolutely overwhelmed. Hospitalizations skyrocketing over 100 percent in Dallas. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky is at Neighborhood Medical Center in Dallas. Yeah, Allison, good afternoon. The numbers keep rising, as does frustration for the health care staff here in Texas, specifically uh, at this drive through testing site, where just a few weeks ago they were seeing a few dozen cars roll through. Today they will likely see more than 300. Their positivity rate for this single site is 18 percent. And when you look across the state of Texas, uh, we are seeing hospitals running out of room at a concerning rate. We know that in the city of Austin, ICU beds are in short supply, and part of the frustration lies in the fact that there are still people who do not believe COVID is a real threat. And I want you to hear what uh, the coordinator here at this testing site had to tell me about some of what she encounters in this line behind me. Take a listen. We're fighting a losing battle, honestly. Um, it's everywhere you turn, you, you, you face resistance, um, not only in patients themselves, but in leaders and authority figures. And if we were just all to be on the same page, heading in the right direction, everything would be such more smooth running. And we're not in that place right now, unfortunately. And she tells me that frustration is compounded by the fact that there are state leaders that have taken away measures local leaders can take to try to curb the spread of the virus. Texas Governor Greg Abbott has signed an executive order essentially outlawing a municipality or a local leader from enacting a mask mandate or a vaccine requirement uh, or even putting limits on social gatherings. Uh, the governor making it clear that Texans can get vaccinated if they so choose, uh, but he entrusts them to take the best safe practices to curb the spread of COVID-19. And dream that she would be in the hospital. It's hard. 
Casey Broad's daughter now recovering from a serious case of COVID, and she's not alone. The virus making more children sick. The American Academy of Pediatrics reporting 72,000 new cases in the last week of July, up 85 percent from the week before, begging the question, is the Delta variant more dangerous for kids? NBC News medical reporter Erica Edwards joining me now. So, Erica, let's get right to that big question. If a child gets sick with the Delta variant, is it more dangerous? What are doctors telling you? Hey, Allison, good afternoon. This is sort of a tricky question because it, it appears that Delta has not made this virus more dangerous, per se, for children overall. What it's done is that it, it's increased how well it spreads among kids. You know, you have this group for which there is no vaccine. They are largely left unprotected. And, um, you know, many doctors are telling us that, you know, even though you know, the virus isn't necessarily more dangerous. They're seeing this large increase of cases, more than 85% over that last week in Ju uh, July. That's what's making this definitely more worrisome for, for doctors. Here's listen. The Delta variant affects children basically the same way in the same distribution um, as the original novel COVID-19 virus we believe at this point. And what is different is that children now make up the most susceptible population because children under 12 are 100% not vaccinated. Yeah, and it appears that even kids who are immunocompromised, um, they're largely left unprotected without a vaccine, Allison. Erica, the physician in chief at New Orleans Children's Hospital told you the Delta variant is an infectious disease specialist worst nightmare. Why and why is the timing in particular so bad here? All of these, the, sort of a convergence of all of these things. Um, you know, this increased conta contagiousness of the Delta variant um, coming at a time when we have children under age 12 who have no vaccine. They're starting to go back to school. They're all going to be, um, you know, uh, commuting once again. And, you know, this is inevitably going to lead to increased cases. Um, so, uh, you know, again, this is really kind of the worst nightmare, the perfect storm, if you will, of all these things coming together that's really only going to lead to increased cases. And when you have these increased cases, unfortunately, you will see more kids becoming uh, more severely ill um, and becoming hospitalized with COVID-19, Allison. Eric, I know one of the biggest concerns for parents, especially of young children, is that you can't get your kids vaccinated if they're under 12. Any updates there? What's sort of the latest timeline on getting a COVID vaccine approved for kids under 12? Yeah, so the American Academy of Pediatrics, a really influential group of pediatricians, is urging the FDA to really act quickly to authorize the vaccines for kids under age 12. Uh, the president of the AAP sent a letter to the FDA yesterday urging this, um, saying that, you know, with the uh, increased spread of Delta, now is really the time to act and that, you know, she was saying that there really is enough data right now to, um, you know, to, to, um, to, to have, you know, to make sure that kids are getting the appropriate dose in the appropriate timing. Um, you know, uh, Pfizer right now is probably the, the most, um, the, the quickest to um, apply for authorization for kids under age 12. Um, those who are in charge of the Moderna trials are saying that in general, their data will not be um, available until late December, um, no November or December. I think overall, it's gonna be midwinter until we see um, a vaccine for kids yeah. under age yeah. 12 in this country. You've still got a ways to go. <laughs> Erica, thanks so much for your reporting today. Some kids are already heading back to the classroom in the U.S. Most schools will be open in about a month. Their teachers heading into another challenging year. You've got COVID, the mask and vaccine debate, and staffing shortages. CNBC reporter Kate Rogers joining me now. So, Kate, this teacher shortage isn't necessarily new, but the pandemic really making some educators rethink their work. Uh, what are you hearing about the effort to find teachers? 
Hey, Allison, great to be with you. Well, this teacher shortage predates the pandemic, as you mentioned, but a survey taken this spring uh, from Frontline Education looked at about 1,200 districts around the country. Two-thirds of them said that they were facing a staffing shortage of teachers. Now, a separate survey from the American Federation of Teachers and RAND said that about one in four teachers said that they were considering or would likely leave by the end of the 2020 into 2021 school year, and about 80% said they were facing higher rates of burnout and stress. So all of that combined points to a potential uh, problem here being exacerbated by the pandemic and everything that's playing out now in the school system. Texas and Florida account for a third of all the new COVID cases in the country, but the governors of those states are saying schools can't enforce mask mandates. What are teachers in those states saying? Yeah, we spoke to a teacher in Broward County, which has been going back and forth uh, with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis over these mask mandates. Uh, we spoke to a math teacher there. He's been teaching for 41 years. He's definitely not ready to leave over this. His name's Jim Garb, but he basically said masks make sense to protect both me and my students. Take a listen to what he had to say. Well, I have no problem, you know, wearing a mask and making sure that, you know, I'm safe. Hence, my family is safe, you know, washing hands and all that kind of stuff. Like I said, this could have been in the rearview mirror or awful close to it if uh, common sense would have been, you know, used. Now, the concern for teachers like Guard is that if the county does go ahead with its mask mandate and the governor does pull funding from some of those schools that defy his executive order, that could lead to budget cuts and potentially make the shortage in those areas even worse. Kate, I heard there was an Unmask Our Kids rally in Connecticut this week. I know there have been uh, several of those. Governor Ned Lamont saying, though, that he's not planning on bringing back a statewide mask mandate there. So what's this group worried about in particular, and why are they so against masking in schools? Yeah, there are uh, chapters of this group all over the country holding rallies really to let state and local leaders know that they do not want them interfering, you know, with decisions that would be made in their own homes about whether or not their children wear masks to school. Uh, so that's a fight that we'll see continue all over the country. But, you know, they're basically saying we want to decide this within our own homes. We don't want to hear uh, from the school district or the school itself or the state that we have to put masks back on our kids, particularly younger kids heading into this school year. Kate, uh, one more question for you. In the past, the major teachers unions have opposed vaccine mandates. Where do those unions stand on vaccine mandates now? Any change because of the concerns with the Delta variant? Certainly divided, and we spoke with the American Federation of mm -hmm. Teachers for this story, they're doing a nationwide tour to make sure that teachers, parents, and kids who are eligible do go out and get the vaccine. They have said that about 90% of their membership uh, are vaccinated, but we just saw yesterday Randy Weingarten, the AFT president, speaking to the New York Times, saying that she's potentially leaving the door open here uh, for a vaccine mandate because Delta is so bad. So while I think they've kind of shied away from it in the past, and we've seen some bigger unions like the New York State Teachers Union say we don't want this, I think now some union leaders are considering they may have to make a change here if things get even worse heading into the fall. All right. Uh, it's kind of a tough situation heading into this new school year still. We thought we might be in a better position mm -hmm. in 2021. Kate, thank you so much. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce. She is standing by with our favorite edition of the headlines, the Friday version. Simone, how are you? Hey, Allison, you got it. All right, we are going to start with the Justice Department defending the latest eviction moratorium. So the DOJ saying a lawsuit by a group of landlords should be rejected after the motion argued that extending the moratorium beyond July is outside of the CDC's authority. Now, the DOJ adding that this moratorium is different, though, because it only focuses on areas of high or substantial transmission. And United Airlines is implementing one of the strictest vaccine mandates for a U.S. company that we have seen yet. The airline is saying today that all 67,000 U.S. employees must get the COVID vaccine by October 25th or risk termination. This makes United the first U.S. airline carrier to do so.
And now to the escalating tension in Ethiopia. Rebel forces from the Tigray region have taken control of Lalibela, a holy site for Orthodox Christians. The town is home to 12th and 13th century monolithic churches designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Officials from the U.S. and U.N. who visited Ethiopia this week have been raising the alarm about the growing conflict there. And a devastating, devastating fire in Illinois has left at least five children dead. Police say the siblings aged two to nine years old were left home alone without an adult when a fire broke out inside their apartment building. The children's mother had reportedly left to run an errand and returned to find the building on fire. The cause of that fire is still under investigation. And Japan commemorating the 76th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. Japan's prime minister joining survivors and others, other officials for a memorial service in a moment of silence at the Hiroshima Peace Park. The bombing on this day in 1945 killed 140,000 people. Hiroshima's mayor calling on world leaders to commit to nuclear disarmament as seriously as they tackle a pandemic, calling them both threats to humanity. Allison, I'll send it back to you. All right, Simone, thank you so much. With the 20th anniversary of the September 11th attacks coming up, nearly 1,800 victims, families, survivors, and first responders have a message for President Biden. Don't come to our memorial events unless the administration declassifies documents that may show links between Saudi leaders and the attacks. NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Kuby all over this story for us. Courtney, those families releasing a statement today calling for transparency from President Biden. What else does that statement say? Yeah, that's right. So they're asking the White House to release these documents. Many of them are supporting evidence uh, that, that the families believe shows a link between the Saudi government and the attacks on 9-11. Many of the documents actually stem from this widespread investigation that the FBI carried out that was completed in 2016. The families believe that there is evidence in there that has been classified all these years that shows that Saudi leadership was aware of and may have even been complicit in parts of the planning of, this, of the attacks on 9-11. The statement, the statement read that the families released today read in part that 20 years later, there is simply no reason, unmerited claims of national security or otherwise, to keep this information secret. But if President Biden reneges on his commitment and sides with the Saudi government, we would be compelled to publicly stand an objection to any participation by his administration in any memorial of 9-11. What they're talking about there on, on this claim of reneging on his commitment Last year, in October of 2020, then-candidate Biden wrote a letter to these families and said that he understood their position on the release of these documents and that he would direct his Department of Justice to look into releasing them and that he promised full transparency on the issue at the time. These families saying now that they have not received that transparency and calling on the president to release the documents, Allison. Courtney, you spoke with Brett Eagleson. His father was killed on September 11th. Uh, what did he tell you about his fight to get more information here? He just he, he said over and over that he feels that his government is failing him, that they have been asking for these documents for years. Uh, you know, as they point out in the letter and as Brett said in the interview with me, it's been 20 years. These families have been asking for answers for 20 yeah. years and, that, and they are calling on the administration to do what previous administrations have not done and to provide them with this information. Now, I should point out that many of these families, including Brett, are part of a lawsuit where they are they are suing the Saudi government um, for their ties to this uh, to the 9/11 attacks. There have been a number of investigations, and and one that is very well known that the the investigation and the report on 9/11 that was released about 15 years ago. You know, they find that there is there are ties between the Saudi people mm -hmm. and the Saudi government, but they never find a smoking gun. They, uh, they, they do say that there are yeah. ties between the Saudi populace and funding for al-Qaeda, but not a smoking gun to the attacks on 9-11. On That's what Brett and these families believe exists in these classified documents. And they're just saying that, you know, after all this time, they want to know who really is responsible for the deaths of so many of their loved ones. So, Courtney, it seems like a reasonable request, especially given the fact uh, that, that President Biden did promise more transparency. So how is the White House responding to these families uh, and their statement today? 
and he's promised more transparency. And, and in the case, something that is sort of similar, the Jamal Khashoggi investigation, the Biden White House actually did put out some of these inf this inf information that uh, linked ties back to the Saudi government, which, of course, that happened only several years ago. We're talking two decades ago, and these families still don't have it. But I can tell you, Allison, literally just in the last few moments, we have found out, according to a source familiar, uh, that the Department of Justice is going to review these documents and they're going to look into some past claims for why they've been kept classified, uh, including um, the State Street Secrets Act and uh, this, this principle that says that federal law enforcement documents can be kept withheld from the public for reasons of, of uh, secrecy and for classification and in keeping sources and methods protected. The Biden administration now saying that the DOJ will look into this. But the families I've just received, so before, right before we went on the air here today, I found a, uh, received a statement from the families who are saying, look, we don't want another review. We want the information declassified. There has been, we've had promises in the past that yeah. this information will be provided to us. Now is the time. It's been 20 years, and they want the information provided to them yeah. before the anniversary this, of the attack this year, which is only in a couple of weeks, Allison. Well, let's hope, Courtney, they get some more information. I, I can't imagine waiting 20 years to get more answers about what happened to your loved ones. I know they just must be agonizing over this. Thank you so much for your reporting. Thanks. It's time for Congress to act again to protect the right to vote. Attorney General Merrick Garland sending that message today on the 56th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. Garland wrote an op-ed in today's Washington Post that says, quote, Our society is shaped not only by the rights it declares, but also by its willingness to protect and enforce those rights. 18 states enacted new laws this year that make it harder to vote. Garland saying the Justice Department is using all its current legal authorities to combat that new wave of restrictive voting laws. It's time for the bottom line, our daily look at what's going on in the business world and beyond. The July jobs report, the big news of the day, it was strong. The U.S. economy added 943,000 jobs in July. The unemployment rate dropping to 5.4 percent. So let's bring in Caleb Silver, Investopedia editor-in-chief, back with us for a second day in a row. Caleb, as you pointed out yesterday, the estimates for this July report were sort of all over the place, but there is no doubt this one was on the very high end, a strong report indeed. Uh, so run us through the gains uh, and where this puts us in our economic recovery. Yeah, very strong gains, and they also revised uh, June and May higher. So job gains earlier this summer, also very strong. But we did see 943,000 jobs added. The biggest area, obviously, leisure and hospitality, the hardest hit sector during the pandemic, the strongest sector on the way back. We saw 380,000 jobs there, two-thirds of those, Allison, restaurants and bars. So waiters, waitresses, cooks, et cetera, getting hired into the restaurant industry. We'll see if those, ja uh, those gains stick going forward with concerns about the pandemic. Pandemic, indoor mass restrictions, et cetera, yeah. but very strong gains there, strong gains in local government education and decent gains in professional and business services. We also saw the fourth straight month of wage gains, uh, wages up 11 cents now to $30.54 on average for U.S. workers. Finally, wage gains. Good. Finally, the worker has the upper hand here. Yeah. And finally, some real robust hiring. Pay the people some more money. They need it. Come on. Uh, Caleb, that jobs report pushed the markets to new highs. The Dow up 144 points today. It hit a new record. The S&P, oh, 140. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Oh, it's, that's a moving Dow. The S&P putting up a record-setting day, too. Uh, was this all about the jobs report? Are there some other things at play here? In a way, it is. And I think investors were kind of concerned if we did have a really low number, then we were on a really serious downward trend there. But now that they see the strength here, the strength in the economy looks pretty robust almost everywhere you look right now. So investors were continuing to lean into stocks, especially the Dow Industrials, especially the financials, which should benefit from continued resurgence yeah. of the economy. Tech stocks, not so much. We've seen tech stocks sort of pull back, especially the stay-at-home favorites from last year, Peloton, Zoom, et cetera. Those stocks have not been doing that great. But yeah. the the industrials, the financials, and the transport. Some of the transports have been doing very well right now. So different type of recovery, yeah. but money's still in stocks, and U.S. investors are still pretty bullish on the stock market. Caleb, you've got a great term of the week for us today because it is something economists are really worried about and watching out for. Tell our viewers, if you will, what stagflation is. Well, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not a bachelor party gone off the rails, but stagflation is that is when you have <laughs> high unemployment, slowing growth, 
Um, but rising prices. And the concern was that if we didn't get a good jobs report here and we continue to see unemployment hovering, hovering around 5.9, 6%, that we would be in that stage where we're not growing. We still have a lot of people out of work for whatever reason, but prices continue to rise. It looks like we may skirt that just by a little bit here. Stagflation is kryptonite for the economy. It's like quicksand. You can't get traction yeah. anywhere. There's no pricing power among companies and people aren't working, so people aren't spending. You don't want to wind up there. You want to be sort of where we are now, kind of a uh, a hot barbecue, but not too hot. Caleb, you're the editor in chief of Investopedia. So, can we sort of like, do you have any pull here? Can we slip in a secondary meaning for stagflation? Like, it's a, a, a bachelor party gone wild or, uh, when it's a, an economist only bachelor party? Absolutely. I've created my own set of terms, uh, the alter terms for Investopedia, because I have a weird imagination. But stagflation is one you want to remember, but one you also want to avoid, like quicksand. Absolutely. Caleb, we're going to have to get you back on to talk about those alternative terms. I got to go, but is there one thing in particular overall that you say is the biggest thing to watch out for next week? Yeah, it's going to be another big week of earnings, and finally, companies are getting rewarded for beating those estimates, but more importantly, for raising their estimates going into the third quarter. Uh, investors are all about the future, so keep an eye on that, and keep an eye on some of those inflation reports to see where we're feeling and how consumers are doing uh, going into the next couple of months. All right, don't get into any stagflations over the weekend. We'll catch you next week. Nice to see you. See you next week. A legal debate is heating up. Workers at companies that require COVID vaccines could lose their unemployment benefits if they're fired for not getting the shot. CNBC reporter Rahel Solomon covering this story for us. Rahel, major companies, we're talking Walmart, Disney, requiring their employees get vaccinated. And in most parts of the country, they can legally fire workers who choose not to get the shot. But what are the rules here? What should we know? Hey, Allison. Yeah, so it's a question that employers have been wrestling with. Labor Secretary Marty Walsh saying today that they're looking at just how far employers can go in terms of requiring their workers to get vaccinated. President Biden also weighing in earlier, saying that he plans to have the backs of private and public sector leaders who make it a requirement. So clearly companies are beginning to feel like the law may be on their side because we're hearing it and seeing it with more and more companies coming up with this requirement. The belief, Allison, is that the requirement is for the greater good of the larger workforce. What's interesting, though, is that the federal government, the country's largest employer, stopped short of a full requirement, saying that, you know, workers could either get vaccinated or face increased testing or, of course, wear masks. So there may be some concern there about the legal standing of such a requirement. Uh, we should say that the ADA has weighed in, saying that it is not necessarily um, illegal. But we will continue to see this become an issue as more and more companies start to mandate it. So, Rahel, we know there's a lot of misinformation out there about vaccinations. Facebook flagging as partly false, a post that was encouraging unvaccinated workers to force their employee, employers rather to fire them so they could get jobless benefits. That is definitely not good advice, and it could even put their unemployment benefits in jeopardy. So could you fact check this one for us? What is the reality here? Well, our reporting actually indicates the opposite, that if you work for a company that requires a COVID vaccine and you quit or are fired, you actually will not qualify for unemployment. The reason is because it's considered a rule violation or misconduct. There are, of course, exceptions, religious or health concerns, disability. We should also say that unemployment is run by the state offices. So there's always some discretion there. But overall, uh, the unemployment lawyers that we spoke to for this story say that it's going to be a really tough task to qualify for unemployment after refusing company policy even if that is a vaccination requirement, Allison. All right, so bottom line, get your news from the news. Don't believe everything you read on Facebook. Those posts aren't always true and accurate. All right, Rahel, so what are the risks here for companies, though, and even our broader economy? If people start losing their jobs over the COVID shot, could this be a problem for our recovery? It's an interesting question. I think, as we saw in today's jobs number, jobs growth is really strong. It has been. Uh, so hard to know what type yeah. of larger impact this will have economically. But it may be more of an issue, Allison, that makes its way through the courts as companies continue to institute these mandates. And, you know, public perception, public opinion about requiring such a mandate is really split. CNBC did a survey a couple of weeks ago, I want to say, and I believe it was 60-40 people who thought that, you know, it was fair for employers to require a mandate. So public perception still seems pretty split about whether it's uh, fair or the right yeah. thing to do. Yeah, people really divided on this one. Rahel, thank you so much. Uh, a very happy Friday to you. You too. <laughs> 
From the streets to the links, a black-owned golf co clothing company shaking up the golf world, using its brand to promote diversity in the sport. Joining me now, the founder of Eastside Golf, Elijuan Ajanaku. Elijuan, we are so stoked. Are you are you talking to us from a cart? This is incredible. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, I am. I'm in uh, uh, actually New Jersey right now. We're playing with. Uh, a couple of friends, actually, Justin Tuck from the New York Giants, he retired not too long ago, and my co-founder, Earl, as well, uh, and a couple of investors as well. It's a yeah, good time out here. We're familiar with those names. Oh, okay. <laughs> we, we, New Yorkers, we New Yorkers know that, that retired guy you're talking about. What course are you guys on? <laughs> for sure, for sure. No, it's a, it's a nice day out here. It's wonderful. So I'm, I'm, great to, I'm, I'm so grateful to be out on the golf course right now. Where are you golfing? Uh, we're uh, golfing at uh, actually Knickerbocker Country Club in New Jersey. It sounds sounds outstanding. All right, this is a big day yes. for you guys. You're golfing before an enormous day tomorrow. You're dropping a shoe collab with Jordan Brand. That is beyond cool. Eastside Golf, the yes. first golf brand to ever work with Jordan. So tell us about the Eastside Golf by Air Jordan Retro 4 golf cleat. It's gorgeous. And how did this all come together? No, nah, thank you, thank you. We uh, actually, first off, we met with uh, Chris Paul's brother, CJ Paul, and he has a uh, big okay. interest. He had a big interest in Eastside Golf, and one thing led to another. He uh, saw the brand, and he wanted to introduce us to somebody from Nike, and they love the brand, so they introduced us. His name is Gentry Humphrey, VP at Nike, introduced us to uh, MJ, and we pitched our idea to Michael Jordan. Oh. He loved it, and uh, at the end of the pitch, he was just like, "Well, have we signed these guys yet?" You know, and you know, you guys oh tell, God. you guys have amazing stories. Like we tell the best stories that we signed them yet. So one thing led to another. We end up uh, actually coming out with a shoe. I do all the designs myself, and uh, that's the design I came up with. And it, you know, the semen on it, uh, it shows grit, determination. And on top of that, the gold on there, it actually resembles the gold chain in the actual logo. So it was a great opportunity, and Nike enjoyed it. Jordan, MJ enjoyed it, and is enjoying it. And, I mean, it's just a great opportunity, for sure. So you've been playing golf since you were a kid. You're a Morehouse grad and part of the Morehouse golf team that won a national championship. That is awesome. Yes. I understand you left a career in finance to start Eastside Golf back in 2019. What inspired you to make that jump? Well, honestly, I got home one day fully suited, you know, and I was just like, you know, this isn't it. I want to play golf. I want to do something that I want to do. And in commercial finance, I was always helping other businesses to start, well, actually owner operators in uh, commercial vehicles to start their businesses, you know, owning trucks, owning uh, types of, uh, definitely types of fleets you know, to help their uh, commodities that they're shipping. So I was just like, why not me start my own brand, you know, and why not actually use something to fund my own golf career, you know, because that's something that I want to do is turn pro in golf. So uh, why not take the entrepreneurial route? So I took the entrepreneurial route, end up finding sponsors that, uh, that love the business instead of uh, trying to sponsor an actual athlete. And here we are, we fund, I mean, we're going through our first round, you know, interviews, so, well, as far as interviews, I mean, um, fundraising investments through our company, and it's just been going up ever since. You know, I mean, it's 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 an incredible thing because now we can bring attention to a new logo that says the next generation can be themselves and actually play the play the game comfortably. And this game is for you. Take advantage of it. That is an absolute awesome story. We're so excited for you. Thank you for taking time out of your golf game to talk to us. Elijah Wan, congratulations on the business and the shoe drop. Awesome to have you on today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Francina McCory is a two-time Olympic gold medalist who ran with Allison Felix in two Olympics. She joins me now. Francina, this is Allison's 10th medal. She is now the most decorated female track athlete ever. She's doing it as a mom. What was it like for you to see your old teammate make history today? Oh, my goodness. It's just so well-deserved. She's such a phenomenal person, phenomenal athlete. I'm so happy for her. I knew she was going to get it done. I knew she wasn't going to leave out there without a medal, and she did it. So I'm so proud of her.
Yeah, you called this one. Last time we talked to you, you had so much faith that she was going to get it done. So I have to ask you about tomorrow, the 4x400 relay. Allison's competing again. She's got a chance to win her 11th medal, break Carl Lewis's record, become the most decorated U.S. track athlete of any gender. What are your predictions? Will the U.S. take this one? Is Allison about to set a new record? Of course, of course. The 4x4, that's my thing. We always dominate the 4x4, so I know they're going to get out there and kill it and bring home another goal for USA. You have the most amazing confidence. That seems to be the secret sauce for this track and field team. You certainly believe. Uh, Francina, the Olympic Games wrap up this weekend. It has sure been a year uh, unlike any other. What have been some of your favorite moments from these games? Are there a couple of things that you just enjoyed uh, above and beyond anything else? First of all, I like all the different hair changes, right? Like, everybody came out with something different every day. So that was awesome, you know. But several world, records, several world records were broken. You know, my sleep schedule has been off. I've been waking up at 6 a.m. to watch it. But it's, it's been worth it. I'm kind of sad that it's ending. It's been a blast. <laughs> It, it has been so much fun, and we've loved talking to you. As you said last time, you got to look good to feel good. I'm loving all those athletes changing it up, looking good, feeling good as they go out there and crush it and get those medals. Francina, thank you so much. Thank you. It's a new era for college athletes. In June, the NCAA made a landmark decision, allowing them to make money off their name, image, and likeness. So how are they handling that new responsibility? NBC News Now correspondent Maura Barrett visited Michigan State, where the school's helping its athletes manage their success off the field. The touchdown by Michael Dowell. Michael Dowell is the third brother in his family to play football at Michigan State, but he's the first to make money while playing in college. I think it puts the power back in the players' hands. Under new NCAA rules, student athletes can profit off rights to their name, image, and likeness. It allows student athletes to be creative, and if you're passionate about something, it you know excites you to learn more because now I can make money off of what I'm you know passionate about. Dow's passion. Helping young athletes get opportunities. So he's partnered with Elite Tackling Systems, a company geared towards growing younger players. Nia Cloudin, a star basketball player, was surprised the decision was announced and enacted so quickly, but is eager to benefit. For us to be able to profit from it, I feel like, why not? I feel like it's our name. We're entitled to that. This argument long used in the debate over whether student athletes should be compensated for playing at the college level. Some athletes even penalized for accepting gifts. Bush making history not of the good kind. First football player ever to return a Heisman Trophy. They ruled Bush and his family had gotten hundreds of thousands of dollars in gifts back when he was a college student. Michigan State head football coach Mel Tucker has watched the change in sentiment since he was a student athlete. I thought, wow, if I was, if, I wish we had that when I was in school. I think they deserve that. You know, they, they work really hard. Uh, they do they do a great job in the classroom. Uh, they, they are ambassadors for our university. I mean, they, they, they give us everything they have, you know, every day on and off the field, and I believe that they should be able to benefit from that. He knows that scoring deals is an unfamiliar playbook for these college athletes. So as Michigan State shapes their players into strong athletes on the field, they created a new program to ensure their success off the field. Yeah, we can't uh, negotiate the deal for the student, um, but we can try and sort of wrap ourselves around them and give them as many tools as we can to to get them as best positioned as we can to take advantage of opportunities and to not be taken advantage of. The Evergreen program educates them on professional skills like building their brand, negotiating contracts, and financial management. I type in the um, transaction name, how much it was, and then now you know, there's, there's receipts of it. I had never worked a job before, so just learning all new things about taxes and W-2s and a lot of stuff that has really helped make this transition easier instead of just throwing us out there. The goal, training the students to make the most of the new rules and how to avoid bad deals. They're telling us that, you know, there's going to be vultures that are going to come and try to take advantage of college athletes. Both athletes know they might not make it pro. As they graduate, they could be competing for the last time. Now you're, you're not just representing your school, but you're also representing yourself. Coach they Tucker wants this program to prepare them for that reality. They know that we see them as individuals, we see them as people, and not just football players. And I think that's, that's the way it has to be. We owe it to these guys to make sure that they're prepared for life after football.